Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So it's a new year, and I thought it'd be a lot of fun to check in with some of my favorite political uh, friends to find out what they think about what's going on in uh, the province of Ontario, the country of Canada, the world, uh, because it's been an interesting uh, it's been an interesting couple of years. And so I want to introduce you again to Sarah McIntyre, Daryl Wolk, and Mark Keeley. Uh, they're all uh, politically active. They're all involved in government affairs. Uh, uh, consulting and uh, advising right now, and they've all been uh, involved in politics in the past. Um, uh, Sarah with Stephen Harper, Mark with John Turner, and uh, Daryl running for office himself. And so maybe I could just ask each one of you to tell us in a, in a sense or two a little bit about uh, you know what your involvement in, uh, in politics and what you're doing right now is. Mark, why don't you go first? Yeah, sure. So our company, K&A Inc., we are, uh, we've been around now for 17 years. We're doing stuff all across Canada and every uh, city and every province and uh, at the federal level. And we do a lot of public policy, a lot of regulatory work. And it, it hasn't uh, it hasn't slowed down at all. As a matter of fact, it's uh, it's heating up in 2022 seems to be for us anyway, a whole heck of a lot more active than it was in uh, the years previous. I'm uh, I'm delighted to be here, Brian. Thanks for Fantastic. having me. Thanks for joining us again. Sarah, what about yourself? Well, I've been in politics off and on for about 20 years, mostly on the federal level. And as you noted with Stephen Harper, but that was many, many years ago. Uh, now I run my own consulting company, Vucacera, um, and we focus on government relations and strategic communications, as well as stakeholder relations. And uh, like Mark, I've been getting busier and busier as the years, as the uh, months go on and COVID becomes less of a of a priority and and uh some of my clients are looking for some more long-term planning at the policy level fantastic my favorite uh my favorite story about sarah is that um i guess probably when you were working for harper someone did a uh, caricature of you as wonder woman and uh and it's really quite the unbelievable picture of you uh with a shield and uh, you're about to attack <laughs> someone and it's really quite uh, quite impressive uh if uh if it was we... actually laura croft brian it was laura oh croft. sorry i apologize yeah, yeah i had the guns and everything it was pretty fun <laughs> if uh, if we get a chance maybe you'll show us all the uh the picture <laughs> maybe <laughs> daryl tell us about you yeah no, happy new year everyone it's a pleasure to be uh, back with you brian uh my name is daryl and uh ultimately i've been involved in politics since i was uh, 16 just at uh, different levels ran for uh, deputy mayor and council in uh, newmarket and my day jobs with the ontario municipal social services association and we've definitely been busy over the last uh, two years with social assistance community housing homelessness uh long-term care public health uh so all the fun files during the pandemic and i gotta tell you uh I worked for Daryl. I mean, Daryl worked for me. I, we worked together uh, at one point in time on the Mississauga Summit. And, uh, and even though he's got a different political orientation than mine, he's one of the most impressive gentlemen in politics I've ever met. And it's a real shame that he wasn't elected. And I'm sure he's going to run again and he's going to contribute uh, to, uh, to Canadian society in, a, in a, an even bigger uh, degree than he already has. Anyway, the three of you, I really appreciate uh, you joining us. Um, so we've had a federal election. Uh, I talked to each one of you uh, during that federal election campaign. Uh, we're now uh, in a minority government. Um, we've got a pandemic uh, that uh, that a lot of us maybe back in November thought was coming to an end and then bang, Omicron uh, comes and uh, now we're in the, the worst statistics that we've got. On uh, Thursday, we're going to be... Uh, I think all focused on uh, January 6th, a uh, year ago in the United States, as all the news programs are going to be repeating everything that happened. I'm not sure if any of you read the Globe Mail this weekend, but a uh, whole intersection on, uh, you know, whether democracy is at an end in the United States, which was kind of uh, shocking. We've had residential uh, school uh, issues. We've had uh, race issues. We've had uh, COP26, climate change. You know, it just, I can't remember, you know, when was it? 30, 40 years ago, someone thought it was the end of history and wrote an article about that. And it's just like stuff going on like crazy. And then even last week, I had a guy on my show that talked about more than 100,000 troops at the Russian-Ukrainian border. Like, what's going on? What, what do you guys expect to be the big stories in 2022? Mark, why don't well, I start with you? <laughs> no, listen, I, I'm happy to to chime in on this. I think you know we're not going to be out of the woods for um, the immediate short term on this issue with the pandemic. I think uh, the the Omicron does one thing: it's, it says to at least uh, all of us here in Canada that 
our governments, and I'm saying both provincially and federal, had done the right thing in making sure that they supported that everybody would get a vaccination. So if you look at, uh, sure, we have numbers for uh, contagions with respect to Omicron, but uh, hospitalizations or deaths are way down as a consequence of the fact that people have chosen in this country in large, large numbers to get vaccinated. So we now, we're now at a stage where the majority of those over the age of 60 are getting a third uh vaccine for the booster, and those are all paying off. I think, you know, I talk a lot with uh, folks in the healthcare sector, as you know, Brian, and a lot are very, very uh, pleased that uh, the, the numbers that we have in this country for uh, for vaccinations are high. But I, I make that point, and then I, I, I want to jump to, you know, one of the things that's going to really, really uh, uh, capture the hearts and minds of everybody in this country is at recovery over rescue. Uh, we've seen a lot with the provinces and the feds looking at uh, the economics of the uh, of the pandemic, and everybody was more or less pleased, and some were were even uh, uh, dissuaded from the actions of the federal government with respect to uh, COVID um, uh, rescue efforts. But that's really changing now. We're looking at more and more attention at recovery from the economics, and those in Q's uh, at the end of Q1 and Q2 are really going to capture, as I said, the attention uh, across this country. Sarah, what about you? What's the big story going to be in the first it's part of It's going to be a really heavy political year, I think. We've got provincial elections in both Quebec and in Ontario. We've also got municipal elections in both Ontario and Quebec and, and many other uh, provinces. And, you know, as, as Mark noted, as we're looking at this endemic, I think this is what we're calling it now is when we're coming out of it, we're all going to be exposed at some level. And we have this protection for with two doses. And Mark, I'm not over the age of 60, but I do have my third shot. Yeah, so do I, but yes, I, I, I heard yeah. it. So, you know, good good on them for rolling that out. I think now is the shift of what is our policy goals going forward? Because it, it isn't simply just to um you know, stay and survive. It, it's how do we recover and how do we thrive? And we've got inflation issues, we've got supply chain issues, we've got issues with China, we've got issues with Biden, and all of those things are going to come into play. And then add on top of it, the housing crisis, the opioid crisis, and how do we actually get some real reconciliation after the past two years? And um, and what does that mean for the leader of the Liberal Party, who is currently the Prime Minister? And I I don't think he will be by the end of this year. You don't think he will be by the end of this year? That's going to be an interesting topic. We'll have to come up uh, and chat about some more. Daryl, what about you? What's the big story for 2022? Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of the Debbie Downer. I think uh, this time next year, we're going to be in the exact same position, probably getting our fifth dose. The pandemic will likely be with us uh, through the entire year. I think the central banks are going to be the, the big story this year. As soon as they hike interest rates, I think that will have an effect on both the economy and the housing market. I agree there's going to be uh, social challenges, the opioid crisis, addictions. Uh, different issues associated with lockdowns. I think worldwide, this will be the year of social unrest. I agree. Uh, Trudeau probably won't survive uh, the full year. He's going to take his walk in the snow. And I also think when the midterms come in the U.S., we're going to see a huge Republican sweep. My gosh, it's going to be okay. an interesting well, year. We're going to take, a break. I, I, we're gonna sure. take a break, Mark, for some messages and come back more with this incredible panel in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. It's a real pleasure of mine to uh, to have this year beginning political panel with Sarah McIntyre, former uh, Harper uh, uh, advisor, current government affairs uh, consultant, Mark Keeley, former uh, Turner advisor and uh, public affairs, uh, um, government affairs consultant, and Daryl Wolk, uh, just all around great guy and uh, former uh, candidate now works with, what's the organization? Uh, the Ontario Municipal Social Services Association, or OMSA, as we're called. Thanks so much for, uh, for correcting me in that regard. I appreciate it. So all of you have given us an interesting uh, view of, uh, of the upcoming year. Um, two of you have said that uh, you don't think that Trudeau is going to last uh, the year. The prime minister is going to take a walk in, in either the snow or maybe it's the snow of next uh, year. Um, Sarah, tell me, why do you think Trudeau is going to be gone before the end of the year? I just think his his missteps have created a lot of dissent within his own caucus and people feel that his time is up. He's had his kick at the can many times and um, that the in order to kind of survive 
um, you know, an ongoing minority government that they're going to need some new leadership, you know, whether that's Christian Freeland or, or Mark Carney, um, there's rumblings all around about that. I mean, I, I even saw, I think it was yesterday on a uh, question period on CTV, Bob Fife, Fife the Knife, uh, said that Trudeau wouldn't last the year. And, uh, you know, I, I've been saying that for a while. I think like his last election was his last uh, hurrah. And, um, you know, people wanted to see some continuity. So he wasn't going to leave right away. But, you know, he just continues to, um, you know, put his foot in his mouth and take the, the government off track of um, what it should be focusing on, which is helping Canadians through the pandemic. Mark, do you agree? Well, how, how, how lucky are we, Brian, that we have two great prognosticators, Sarah and Daryl. I mean, they, they see more than anybody in this entire country. And, you know, that, that Sarah is saying that Bob Fife, Bob Fife is the guy that we ought to view as the expert in terms of the future of the prime minister of this country. Wow, how lucky are we? That is not going to guess, Mark. You don't need to be I, upset about it. I am not. I think this is great. I'll tell you right now, we are we are not going to see this prime minister leave at the end of this year. I think, uh, it, as a matter of fact, here's a guy that you you can you can say all you want, but in three successive elections, he's won. And so, whether you call it a minority or not, he's still formed government. So, I think that's a a, a great and um, it's a, and testament to Justin Trudeau and his effective skills. I'll say this too: we've got a prime minister right now who who. Uh, polls higher than his party. We've got a, a prime minister with a fantastic brand. We've got a, a, a government that's done extraordinarily well. Why would he leave? I don't think that this is going to happen at all. I think, as a matter of fact, if you look at, at anything, the guy who uh, we ought to look at who might not last the year is the current leader of the opposition. Yeah, well, I'm going to make uh, Mark happy with uh, further predictions. If you look at the last election, it was basically a waste of time with everybody losing. I, I think uh, Trudeau at this point is a spent force. He's lost the popular vote in two out of three of the last elections. Liberals have lost the popular vote in seven of the last nine elections. I think there's already people uh, organizing. I think we underestimate the burden that politics places during the pandemic. Uh, you know, who would really want to stay under these uh, circumstances? But along with uh, Trudeau voluntarily taking a walk in the snow before the end of the year, I think O'Toole is eventually going to get turfed as well. I think uh, Singh is probably the only one safe. The Green Party is basically extinct unless Elizabeth May uh, returns as leader. And I think the only one who uh, really won the election to some degree was Maxine Bernier, but everything associated with him depends on the pandemic. And if some of these issues disappeared, I don't think he has much room to grow. So we're, we're really in a sorry state as far as federal politics go, but I do think uh, Christia Freeland will be the prime minister before the end of the year. I think uh, there's a good chance Christian Freeland will, will be prime minister in the future, but I don't think before the end of the year, I don't think any of that's going to happen uh, uh, this year. My assessment is that uh, the Trudeau won, um, that uh, we've got a minority government, that the conservatives are going to be in disarray, that the NDP are out of money, and that therefore the chance of a, uh, of a defeat of the government this year is very low. And, uh, and so therefore, the conservatives are going to spend their time trying to figure out uh, whether they keep Aaron O'Toole or... or uh, or send them packing. And, uh, and I think the Conservative Party is going to have a huge issue as to whether they go to the right because of, uh, Daryl, your comment about Maxine Bernier winning, uh, or whether they continue this effort to the center. And, uh, you know, I was interested in a bunch of the articles, and I think that the three of us uh, may have chatted about that at some point in time, uh, Mark and, uh, and Sarah. Uh, you know, there was a bunch of articles written about Aaron O'Toole in that uh, he was copying, copying David Cameron's uh, strategy from the UK, and that if he won, then the Conservative Party forever would be a more centrist party. But if he lost, then the Conservative Party would move to, uh, to the right and uh, become more populist and more like Trump or, 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 or the current uh, Prime Minister in, uh, in the UK. Sarah, what's your prediction for what's going to happen to the Conservative Party and Aaron O'Toole? Well, I'll just say uh, one thing, though. I, I don't think the government needs to be defeated in order for the Liberals to change its leader. We've seen that happen before, Kim Campbell. Um, but I look, I that, think the that worked well. Yeah, <laughs> so true. Exactly. <clears throat> look, I think the Conservatives are in trouble, and, and not just because of the last um, election result. And, and I wouldn't lay it all at the feet of um, O'Toole and his team. When I started politics, and this is a long time ago, uh, there was an amazing amount of thought leadership organizations, think tanks, uh, associations, 
conferences that all fed into the policy making process of the Conservative Party. They weren't directly related to the party, but they were thought leaders. And we don't have those now. You, you can count on one hand how many times you've seen the Fraser Institute or MEI, Montreal Economic Institute or McDonald Laurier Institute actually being quoted in the paper or their, their spokespeople's are actually go-to people for the media now. Um, partly that's because the space is being eaten up by, by COVID and doctors and scientists and, and the like. But I, I think that because we don't have that buffet of ideas feeding into the discourse of conservatism in this country. That's the bigger problem for Aaron O'Toole and the Conservative Party than whether or not they're going to hobble together a policy platform that's going to please all of their elements of their coalition. Hmm. Yeah, and I'd like to say too, if I, with Stephen Harper, one thing that he did really well was keep the coalition together. Like a lot of the Conservative Party, it's made up of social conservatives, libertarians, moderate conservatives, business conservatives, and Stephen Harper managed to keep everybody in the tent and keep everyone happy. I think in the last election, Aaron found a way to anchor everybody. I know a lot of friends who were uh, supporting Peter McKay that were upset with the leadership race. Uh, social conservatives felt like uh, they were pushed to the sidelines and just basically told to shut up and do what was best to defeat Trudeau. I think Bernier appealed to a lot of the libertarian conservatives. And to be totally honest with you, going through the, the last election, even as a conservative, there wasn't much on the platform to get excited about. Uh, it seemed like all three parties, uh, to be honest with you, were offering more or less the same solutions. I, and uh, I think the problem that Aaron's going to have is he ran in the leadership race as the true blue, the, the classic uh, campaign to knock off Peter McKay. And then he almost sort of pulled the Patrick Brown and uh, reversed himself in the general election. And I think given the base of the party and when it eventually comes to a leadership review with the regular members and not so much the caucus, I think he's going to have a, a hard time getting the 50 percent, let alone 70. Daryl, you, know, you said that you thought that uh, Maxine Bernier won. Um you know, maybe I've been not reading the papers, but I haven't heard of Maxime Bernier since the election. Like, yes, uh, his party did well, but he didn't win a seat. They didn't win a seat. And, uh, you know, all the all the the uh, anti-vax uh, protests, I've actually interviewed some of the people, haven't uh, included Bernier at all uh, in them. Uh, so why do you think Bernier won? And what do you think his future is? Well, from what I can tell on, on Twitter, he's been spending his time in Florida just making uh, videos. And when I say when, it's it's a stretch to find a winner in the last election generally. But the reality was he did increase his support from 1% to 5%. I, I think he's identified himself with the anti-vax, anti-lockdown movement. I, it's rare that somebody just starts their own party and has that kind of national support. I saw in places like Windsor, for example, he had 12% support. But again, I think that's not so much a testament to Maxine as a politician or as party. I think it's just a reflection of the anger of lockdowns and pandemic fatigue. And a lot of people who, even when you see on social media, just end the lockdowns, go back to normal, open everything up, COVID's not real. He's definitely found uh, a crowd. And you look at those protests that he was organizing, you know, it's uh, hard to draw a crowd nowadays in, in politics, but he did seem in a couple of rallies to have thousands of people following him. Did he win a seat? No, I guess he he won his leadership review. He's probably paid like a cabinet minister from the party somehow. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think he'll just make noise from the sidelines and uh, stir up trouble uh, as long as the pandemic drags on. Well, and, and, and Brian, I want to chime in here, too, because I think uh, in a way I agree with Daryl, because uh, we talked about this during the election, uh, you, Sarah, and myself. Uh, it, he's a spent force. I mean, it, look, it was it was a moment in time. There were there was some uh, excitement around the fact that he was you know, claiming that uh, this uh, the restrictions were, were causing a, a diminution in business opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think it's a bit of a spent force, uh, the, the uh, People's Party. I do think, though, that one of the things that that I would say in terms of concern Conservatives, where um, O'Toole is really, uh, I'm going to say he's been sort of labeled or painted with the brush of being uh, anti-climate change. I mean, it took him, he was, uh, even during his leadership uh, race, he, he, he backed down on, on climate change because it, it didn't appeal to his base. And during that, the start of the election, in terms of their platform, a lot of the base said, we don't want climate change to be a big issue. And I think that really 
uh, painted him into a corner. So it, it, uh, a lot of people took a, a really hard look at whether they wanted to vote conservative or not. I, I, you know, and I look at that, and again, I want to go back to this point. This prime minister had a hell of a campaign. Uh, nobody thought that he was going to win. Even going into this, the numbers were so low. Uh, he, he's, he not only uh, squeaked out, but look at what happened in the greater Toronto Hamilton area. He did extraordinarily well. And I think that that's testament to him and his party. And I think that, you know, maybe maybe the, the two other guests of this might want to give a bit of credit to that. But uh, at the end of the day, look, we're going to have a very interesting uh, time over the next little while in terms of policies. And you're seeing a prime minister right now who said, I, I look at I'm really focused on uh, red, ridding this country of this pandemic. And if you even look at some of the issues about forcing uh, Canadians to get vaccinated because that's the right and proper thing to do, it's uh, it's certainly playing out in uh, in uh, in polling numbers that are doing well for him. Yeah, I, and and we've, done, we've done reasonably well from a vaccination standpoint and, yes. uh, and, and the way that we've, uh, you know, attacked this pandemic or at least uh, or, or dealt with it versus our neighbor to the south for sure and uh, versus a lot of European countries. Uh, and so I'm surprised, uh, Sarah and Daryl, that you're so negative toward uh, uh, Canada and the prime minister and, 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 the, and the liberal government's uh, pandemic response. <laughs> Look, I mean, everyone uh, ran into the same problems in every G7 country, which was vaccine acquisition, vaccine rollout. Um, anybody, anybody, any leader of any political stripe would have been doing the exact same thing. Um, and, and look, you'll see a lot more, you've seen a lot more agreement between Ford and Trudeau over the past year than you ever have. Um, and it's not that I'm down on him. I, it, it's, it's the fact that we've doubled our national debt in two years. Years, um, that he's, you know, Canadians go, the longest you usually get is three terms. And as three term itis, he seems lost. He doesn't seem like he's got a policy direction. Um, you know, in interviews, he's calling anti vaxxers, misogynists, and racists, and then, you know, backtracking on that. I, I, look, I just think that people uh, will in his own party be saying, okay, when's it our turn? We've done all that we can do. When's it our turn? And, and there will be natural rumblings. And I'm sure, you know, uh, if it's somewhat similar to, you know, Prime Minister Stephen Harper in 2015, he ran in that campaign, of course, and lost, but it was almost that it was his third, it was his time to, to go. He didn't have an agenda. He had done all he wanted to do. And so I think that's what Trudeau's facing himself. It's, it's not necessarily because he's liberal or conservative it's just that he's been around long enough and and you know his numbers are still pulling well as mark mark says but i also think that there is a um there will be a political monsoon uh that will wash over the pro over the country of all of the former pandemic leaders and they're going to get turf because people are going to want a new page and a new start and they're not going to want to see the same people they saw every day on their television for two years when they're trying to recover out of this Okay, so let me let me let me challenge you. Let me let me challenge you a little bit on that, sir, if you could. So so 2015, you're right. Uh, Harper lost. However, if the same people had voted in the 2015 election at, has voted in the previous election, Harper would have won. What the the key to Trudeau was is he motivated a whole bunch of other people to come out to vote that hadn't voted in previous elections, and it was typically younger people and more ethnic people, and uh, and it was very comparable to the the statistical analysis of Obama's success that it wasn't necessarily the existing electorate that had switched their vote because the existing electorate um, still voted uh, for Harper. It was new people that no, came out and voted. And so what that's just hold on, hold on a second, hold on a second. So what you gotta do is you gotta have a conservative vote. There was it was it was twofold. It's never just one thing. And, and remember, you know, it was the conservatives that went out and actually effectively uh, garnered ethnic voters uh, in 2006, 2008, and in 2011 that actually got them the majority. Uh, Trudeau took the playbook, but it was also in 2015 that a number of conservatives sat home and didn't go out and vote. It was, it was a terrible campaign, too, Sarah. Terrible. Mm -hmm. I do, I do have to say with the, the Trudeau win, I wouldn't say this was a huge win. I have to disagree with my, my good friend Mark here. Uh, at the end of the day, when you look at how that election started, he was leading in the polls. He was asking for a majority government. I also believe that he knew what was coming in the, the later part of the year. Uh, even if the pandemic would have ended, benefits would have expired. There was going to be economic pressure. There was going to be inflation. He knew a disaster was coming. He needed a majority government to get through this situation. In the end of it, he you know the Afghanistan thing fell apart. He was protested virtually everywhere. He ran a campaign completely against anti-vaxxers. 
Uh, he currently sits with the lowest support any Canadian government's ever formed. He's lost the popular vote again, two out of three of uh, the last elections. And I agree with Sarah, the throne speech now, completely obsolete. His economic statement, completely obsolete. The issues he's talking about are barely relevant to what's happening today. I think the Liberals are lost. I do think quietly they're, they're organizing. They'd like to see Trudeau leave. But at the same time, the brand is Trudeau. So uh, we'll, we'll see what they do. But I, I think he's a spent political force. And I don't think too many people in Canada are going to change their opinion of him at this point. I, I think we're at this. We, we will have this minority government for the balance of the next four years. That's my prediction, Brian. Well, my there, we're, we're not going into an election anytime soon. I, I tend to agree with you. I don't think it's going to be four years. Uh, but I think it's going to be certainly longer than 2022. Um, uh, that would be my assessment. I think that uh, what the last election taught uh, all the uh, the uh, leaders is that uh, people don't want an election uh, within uh, a year or 18 months of the previous election. They want to wait a little bit longer uh, and uh, they want people to work together and they want to see some uh, progress um, and some cooperation, um, business as usual, whatever you want to uh, call it. Um, and so if it is 2023 or 2024, before you get an election, my assessment is that uh, we'll have a new conservative leader um, and uh, it'll be up to Trudeau at that point in time about whether he leaves or not. And I tend to agree with Sarah that he may take a walk in the snow, but it'll be in 2023 or 2024. And Christian Friedland right now looks like she might be the the uh, the individual that uh, would be elected. I hope that your analogy of Kim Campbell is not repeated uh, in that uh, regard. We're going to take a break for some messages and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about uh, the upcoming provincial election uh, because uh, what happens in Ontario is going to be um, a for sure uh, occurrence in uh, in June of this uh, this year. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Krabby Radio Hour on Saga 960. I don't know about you, but I'm having a heck of a lot of fun chatting with Sarah McIntyre, Daryl Wolk, and uh, Mark Keeley about uh, what's happening in politics. And, uh, and, and, and uh, we obviously have big disagreements in regards to what we think is going to happen uh, federally. But we've got an election coming up provincially in, uh, in June of this year. Um, Daryl, let's start with you because you're the, uh, the expert on uh, provincial politics and municipal politics in, in Ontario. Um, how do you think Doug Ford's doing? I know you were a big Ford uh, supporter at one point in time. Yeah, no, I'll start by saying I'll qualify my predictions that the pandemic's a wild card. So I do think uh, a lot of it's going to depend on public opinion and the event that we're in lockdowns or if we see surging cases uh, in a similar situation that Jason Kenny went through. My personal opinion is if you look at Ontario compared to the rest of the provinces and certainly Europe and the United States, uh, I think he's done a pretty good job. Uh, my prediction is he's going to get reelected if for no other reason, because the opposition is split. If the NDP is in second place, I don't think there's a mathematical way that uh, Ford can be defeated. And then in the Quebec election, I, it all, it all signs point to Lego uh, easily cruising to a victory. Mark, what about you? Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue with that, but I will say this. I I, I just want to I want to get this in because I love arguing with Sarah. Sarah said, you know, people are 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 angry at leaders that have done what they've done uh, during this pandemic. But I think Doug Ford speaks to people, and I think uh, people are seeing that. Even if you look at some of the restrictions that are going to come into place in uh, in Ontario over the next little while, I think people are genuinely uh, uh, compliant with that because I think they want to see that that the government is doing something to make sure that this spread doesn't continue. So I, I think. Uh, Doug Ford will go into this uh, election probably confident, and I think it'll bear out. I, I'm not certain that uh, uh, the, the, the NDP are going to be uh, status quo. I think that there could be a big fight, and you're going to see the libs probably take some away from the conservatives and the NDP, but they won't. Um, uh, they certainly won't become government, that's for sure. Sarah, you were telling me that you thought that Doug Ford had lost a lot of support in uh, in rural Ontario because of the lockdowns and that, uh, that they were putting in place... Mm -hmm. uh, policies that may be appropriate for Toronto, but that weren't appropriate for, uh, for rural Ontario and that uh, right-wing conservatives were losing faith and confidence in uh, Ford. What do you think? Well, I mean, Doug Ford came to office, you know, Ford Nation and mom pa shops and who's been hit the hardest and the longest from these measures is mom and pa shops. Small business owners, I don't know about you, Mark, but my clients are furious and they, uh, they're they not getting answers. They're not getting access. They don't feel that they're listened to. They feel like they're being punished, even though that there isn't any kind of real um, proven out that, you know, restaurants are sources of, you know, super spreaders, for example. And, and so there is an inherent unfairness 
that people feel from these regulations. And they will be punished, I think, at the polls. Now, I still think he's going to get a majority. I think it's going to be substantially reduced, but he's not going to get a majority because people are happy with Doug. They're going to be, he's going to get it because uh, where's Andrea Horvath been and no one likes Stephen Del Duca. <laughs> Period. What a, what I, mean, a, I like him. I think he's a nice guy, but he comes across as a bit angry and white. And Doug at least comes across as less angry and more affable. And Andrea has just been, you know, the NDP perpetually never runs for actual office. They just kind of, you know, sit around in the sidelines and squawk. I mean, you've but, seen. But, 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 sir, look, I think you've got one of the, maybe the difference in, in what you're seeing in the province versus the feds is you've got a, a premier who actually has a cabinet that's very effective. And I think we're seeing, you know, very, very effective uh, cabinet ministers in this government, very effective members of parliament in this government. In Ontario. Yeah, I will say that they are they are competent, but th this is where I, you know you have things that's happened over the weekend. There was cabinet squabbling about what to do next because a lot of the MPs that are in that cabinet or MPPs that are in that cabinet are hearing from the ground that people are sick and tired of these lockdowns. And what is the goal of this? We're all going to get exposed. It's that contagious. So you know, we, didn't didn't we see I me mean, the Ontario Science Roundtable though, Sarah? Uh, was very clear that if you don't do this, you're going to see numbers that are going to... Quit moaning. Like, that's what people hear. Quit moaning. That's what they've heard from the science table. Quit moaning. This, these are people that have lost not just their life savings. They've, they've remortgaged their property. They've had to sell their property. They're hanging on by the skin of their teeth. And there's going to be a cost to that. And it will be at the polls and in June. And I will say that even, you know, at the municipal level here, there's there's still a con in where I am, there's a, still a conversation about vaccines. And you know, Max Bernier's team did very well in this area. And those are going to not necessarily erode Doug's majority, but is definitely going to erode his support level. I think that he will be in a fight in a lot of ridings that he should not be in a fight. Yeah, against, I, I, against I, I agree with, uh, sir. I, I think as a conservative, I mean, I'm personally frustrated. I hate the, the passports. I'm not a big fan of the mandates. I, I don't like the anti-vax uh, rhetoric, and I think the lockdowns are definitely going to hurt a lot of small businesses. I think the big difference between the federal and the provincial is that more likely provincial, if you're upset uh, on those grounds, you're probably just going to stay home and not come out and vote. I yeah. don't really see Randy Hillier, you know, setting the same type of fire uh, across the province as uh, perhaps Maxine Bernier did. Uh, but having said that, the, they are going to face a, a reduced majority, maybe even a minority. I think uh, there are, you know, pandemic fatigue is setting in. And I think uh, people are also getting tired of the Ontario Science Table and Dr. Fauci and a lot of the politics uh, around the health. I think people have heard the same thing for two years now. Wash your hands, wear a mask, uh, get 10 vaccines. Uh, and I think people are sick of it and they can see clearly with the numbers it's not working. So, Mark, you know, it's interesting. Both Sarah and uh, Daryl have... Uh, have talked about a lot of the, the challenges Doug Ford has on the right. Um, people mm -hmm. that are anti-lockdown, that think that he's gone too far, that he's followed the science too much and hasn't uh, worried about mom and pa um, businesses that Sarah talked about that, that have been hurting, there's no question. And I hear a lot of that uh, as well. Um, Stephen Del Duca hasn't resonated. Um, what would you be doing if you were advising the leader of the, of the Liberal Party right now? Well, I, I get a lot more media attention. Like he right now, he's he's spending all of his time on social media. You know, Facebook. He probably has seven hundred and fifty uh, members. That's about it. I'm, I'm being a smarty pants, but at the end of the day, get off social media and start doing something that's going to get mainstream media a little bit excited with you. I, I also think that he needs to look at you know stop being so. And, and I'm going to use the word, I'm probably going to get a whole bunch of emails about this, but stop being so woke and start looking at, at, at making this uh, a, a campaign that's going to actually resonate with people. If I was Stephen Del Duca, I, I wouldn't be saying, you know, Doug Ford is wrong. Doug Ford is bad. Uh, the conservatives are bad and start looking, oh, here's what I'm going to do. I, I don't see this at all. I, I see just a lot of wokeness. I see a lot of political posturing. And I think that's really turning a lot of people off. And, and frankly, nobody's seeing them anywhere except on Facebook. Daryl, one of the big issues they came up with just before Christmas was uh, was highways and uh, and building this 413 and then the Bradford uh, bypass and use that really as a wedge issue between them and, and the conservatives. I mean, and the liberals. What do you think? Does, uh, does, does highways something that people care about? 
I'm from uh, York Region and uh, actually campaigned on the Bradford Bypass. So uh, we've been asking for this project for 50 years and uh, I absolutely support it 100% uh, in terms of the, the 413. And I'm not totally sure where, where that came from. Overall, I have some uh, questions about how we're going to finance all these uh, projects. We've doubled our national debt. We're running bigger deficits than uh, Kathleen Wynne. Uh, at some point, you can't just print money internally. You're going to have to pay it back. And, uh, you know, I love all the subway projects. I thought overall the fall economic statement was a, a reasonably good direction for uh, recovery. Uh, but at some point, uh, you know, we're going to have to pay for all this. In terms of Del Duca, I, on a personal level, I, I like him, but... He does uh, lack charisma. It seems strange when he's on Zoom in his basement uh, being the armchair quarterback. Uh, for people who are frustrated with uh, lockdowns, I don't see him or the NDP as any kind of an appeal. And we always see in the media, all oh, the conservatives are far right and all that. I actually think that both the Democratic Party and the Canadian left have moved pretty far to the left. Uh, as a conservative, even a red Tory, I can't imagine anybody would be looking seriously at either the Liberals or the NDP, uh, given how far left they are on the spectrum at this point. Sir, what do you think yeah, about uh, Highway Committee and Paladin? Right, I was just going to say, it, it's interesting, you know, it, we still have a, there's a, I mean, I'm going to talk about it as a hangover effect from 1990 to 1995. The NDP will never, ever become a government in this province again because of that. And, and I look at, you know, the 15 years that, that the previous government were in power in this province, there's still that issue that's sort of hanging over uh, the current leader of the Liberal Party in the province of Ontario's head. And I, I'm, I'm not going to discount that. So they've got to do a lot to distance themselves with uh, uh, the former premier. Yeah, I think I think the NDP, the NDP and the Liberals are going to have to focus their guns on each other. The reality is, I don't think they're going to pull a lot of votes from the PC party. They're basically competing with the same vote, and I think the, right. the only way forward in any kind of trouble is if Del Duca can land some good shots on Orwath, pass them in second place, and just have the Liberals be the default opposition to Ford for the teachers' unions and all the usual suspects. Never thought I'd agree with you, Daryl. Why don't you <laughs> think there's an opportunity for a party on the right, um, whether it be Hillier or uh, I've interviewed this. Uh, MPP that got kicked out of the Conservative uh, uh, caucus uh, a few times. He's actually incredibly articulate. And uh, and a lot of the things he's argued, you know, a month later, Ford actually, uh, you know, agreed with. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think that there might be, particularly given Sarah's comments about uh, in rural Ontario, where the Conservatives' base is, don't agree with what Ford's doing. And Maxine Bernier did so well. Why don't you think there's a, an opportunity for a party of the right? Well, I think there's an opportunity huge for, for Del Duca, but again, like Mark, he's got to get out of his basement and away from Zoom, and he's actually got to take some riskier positions. Like, he's, like we've been knowing that the Ford government was going to be making an announcement now for three days, and where's been Del Duca? That is prime media spots. They're dying for someone to come in and challenge what's happening and end some speculation and take a position. And where has he been? Where has Andrea been? I don't know, like away at the cottage? But look, you know, I, I think once it comes down to voting time, all of these things that we're talking about, the cost of endemic, the, the debt, all those things, it's going to be real bread and butter issues for average voters. And it's gonna be $1,000 extra on your food bill. It's gonna be an increase to your mortgage rate, your credit card rates. The, the, it's gonna be you know, a, a tighter housing market. And, and those are gonna be the issues that people are gonna say, okay, save another variant, save all these things, which are big you know, exceptions. Um, people are going to want to see, okay, what are they going to do to make housing more affordable, food more affordable, ensure that daycare actually is affordable and available, make sure that I can drive to work without paying $2 at the pump. All of the, this is what people care about. And they're stopping caring about the pandemic. They literally don't care anymore. Everyone I talk to across the political spectrum, no one cares anymore. They want to know what is their going, government going to do to help them survive the next year and actually not just survive, but perhaps maybe grow a little bit. I, I, I would say, though, too, Sarah, but if you look at even um, parents right now who have children in uh, of school age, 
that there's a concern even over the next couple of weeks about the potential for an increase in infections for Omicron. So I, I, I still think that we're going to have to play that out a little bit. But as we're going into this election cycle, I agree with you. I will say this, though. I think, um, you know, that the there, there's going to be a very interesting uh, dynamic as it relates to what municipalities want and and what the province is going to have to fight for in the in the election this June. Interestingly, governments never proact, and we're looking at a provincial government that's really proactive right now. And you're seeing things like in building, uh, uh, you know, massive infrastructure and public transit. I think that's a very good proaction that we're seeing out of this government. And so, you know, to get to your point too, uh, Daryl, about highways, I, I find that um, one of the issues that's going to really sort of rear its head are the, uh, maybe it's Durham region and maybe York region who are gonna start sniping at the government around the um, the the uh, issue on tolls on the first, on the 407. That's gonna, those are gonna be big, big issues that we're gonna have to deal with. One of the issues, Daryl, that you've raised a few times uh, is in regards to debt and deficit and how much it's grown. And uh, the only person that I've really heard Talking about the massive increases in debt in the last couple of years is is a Democratic senator in the United States that stopped the uh, the Build Back Better uh, bill. Um, it, it seems like um, we think we can print money forever, and the central banks can uh, can uh, can you know ease money um, forever. When's the when's the issue of the debt going to come home to roost, Daryl? I think it's going to be this year, quite frankly. If we would have had this conversation in 2019 and we were talking with climate change and one of the panelists had said, uh, you know, the solution is to print uh, 500 trillion and just retrofit all our buildings, everybody would have laughed uh, knowing that inflation would come. I think part of the issue is all the countries around the world are essentially doing the same thing uh, at the same time. That's one of the reasons why we're, we're not in a Venezuela, Zimbabwe type situation. I remember you were angry when I mentioned uh, those were the policies that uh, we were following, but we have adapted new monetary uh, policy. We've got deficits well beyond what we could ever raise taxes or cut our way out of. I think economic growth this entire decade is going to be pretty close to zero. And I think what you're going to see this year is an inflation rate uh, that continues to hover above 5%. I think they're going to probably introduce a couple of rate hikes that won't make any difference. Uh, they probably have to raise interest rates around 5% uh, to counter the inflation. If that actually happened, the government finances would be in complete disarray. The housing market would be cut in half and the stock market would be cut in half. Uh, so I, I think that they might do one, maybe two rate hikes. It won't have uh, too much of an impact except for hurting the economy. And then after that, the Bank of Canada will stop continue doing what they're doing, and we're going to be dealing with 5% uh, uh, inflation for probably the next five years. 5% inflation for the next that's five my, years. That's my thought. Or and and, and, and or, no growth. They, or, so that sounds can. like uh, stagflation yeah, 1970s. Yeah, or they hike rates like they did in the 80s and ultimately crush the housing market, the stock market, and the economy. Well, you really are <laughs> Debbie Downer. Well, no, but this is where I think, you know, one of the things that we do have to do is we have to look at how, how, uh, our economy is so linked to the global economy. And I think, you know, we we ought to be seeing a heck of a lot more attention on uh, some of the Biden um, uh, policies that are being uh, put in place, especially in things like automotive. Uh, so that's, th those are big issues that we're going to have to uh, put the, uh, the government's feet to the fire, both at the provincial and the federal level. You know, yeah. Sarah, during the last two federal elections, the only person that I heard talking Daryl's issues about uh, fiscal prudence was Maxine Bernier. There wasn't a conservative that was focused on fiscal prudence. Look, I, I mean, you focus on fiscal prudence when you have to. And, and, and really, the global pandemic, because it is a global pandemic, has given everyone free reign to print money forever. And but there will be a time when it when the you know it comes home to roost, as, as Daryl says. And I, I agree with him. The the uh, inflation is going to continue, and whether or not we move towards a, a more self sufficient economy, those still will have inflationary cost pressures. We can't we can't make things as cheap here in Canada as as we can from what we import from Asia. I mean, that's just simply the cost. So it's simply, 
you know, labor costs, environmental costs, shipping costs, all of these things that, and all the inputs that it takes to, to build something in Canada is, heavily, is, is, is a lot more expensive than in when we, we import them. But, you know, I think we are going to be dealing with this infl inflationary pressures. Tiff Macklem has kind of signaled, oh, tr inflation is transitory. Oh, what I mean is it's transitory as in long term. Uh, look, we all know it's here, whether it's supply chain interruptions, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's the housing crisis, crisis whether it's food, whether it's atmospheric rivers, all of these things have, have landed inflation on our plate and it will be here for the next two to three years. I mean, but I think when it comes to, to fiscal policy, and that means paying down the debt or increasing taxes, nobody wants to stick their head out and say that they want to do that. Does anybody now really with inflationary pressures, job insecurity, and the past two years of uh, life savings being eaten up by people just trying to survive now want to say, oh, we're going to introduce new taxes to pay for everything no we're still in pollyanna mode we're still yeah, in pollyanna I, I, mode. I agree. We're, we're stuck in a tough spot it's not going to be popular to raise taxes uh, in the middle of a pandemic nobody wants to cut benefits you now you talked about the geopolitics at the beginning of this i mean when the other side of the pandemic comes we are going to see a new cold war between china and the united states and you look mm -hmm. at the united states uh, fiscal situation surprisingly it's even worse than where we're at uh, uh bold prediction i think they're going to default on their debt in the 30s sorry what you think the United States is going to default on their debt? Yeah, in the 2030s, I think they're in serious trouble with their unfunded liabilities, uh, the amount of money on the Fed balance sheet, uh, and they're out of control debt right now. They're in serious financial trouble, and I, China's taking their hit right now with the property market. Uh, you see central banks around the world loading up on gold. I don't think the U.S. Uh, dollar is going to be the reserve currency much longer, and I think they're going to run into some real problems in the 2030s. <laughs> you really are Debbie Downer today. <laughs> So I don't think that uh, you're going to have the United States ever default on their debt. Um, I do think there's a very good chance that uh, that Evergrande um, triggers a uh, financial collapse um, uh, that may rival, frankly, the uh, the Great Recession of uh, of 2008 2009, and uh, that's something that not enough people are paying attention uh, to. And that's not uh, a U.S. led problem. That's obviously a, a Chinese led problem. And I do think that uh, that you've seen a clampdown in China um, of uh, free uh, free markets and democracy and, and capitalism like we haven't seen since uh, the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s. And, uh, and I think that is a story that we're just starting to hear uh, more and more about. And I think that uh, could be a massive impact on, on, on our globe. And I do think, and we haven't talked about it, um, but I do think there's a chance that we could have uh, armed uh, fighting between the Ukraine and, and Russia and what's going to happen, how... NATO and Canada respond. Uh, you know, you don't you don't mass a hundred thousand troops on a border for no reason. And uh, Putin's uh, popularity is low. We haven't talked about that, but Putin's popularity is very low. Uh, if you can if you can believe any of the Western uh, uh, polls, and uh, and his answer is nationalism and uh, fight to get people uh, in in his country on his side and. Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting year. Anyway, let's take a final break and come back with some concluding um, assessments of who's going to be in power uh, after the break. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga Night 60. I've really enjoyed it, guys. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate it. I want to know who you think is, uh, is leader of the Liberal Party, the Conservative Party federally, um, the, uh, the, who's in power uh, provincially in Ontario and Quebec, and who controls Congress in the United States a year from today. Mark? I'm going to say this. The Liberal Party stays static. The, uh, the province of Ontario stays blue. Quebec stays uh, CAC. I think you're going to see in, uh, in the United States, the midterms are just going to decimate the, the Democrats and the Republicans will take over the Senate and the House. And uh, I think you're going to see a weakened president for at least the next two years. Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, Ontario is going to stay uh, blue, uh, but it's substantially reduced. It's going to be a fight. And there, as a result of that, there's always whenever you have a fight as a majority and uh, come out with a tighter one, then there's a little bit of issues with leadership issues uh, within the party. 
Um, I think Quebec will remain Legault. Um, I think municipal elections will matter in Ontario. Um, those are in October. Um, I, I don't see John Tory staying in, in, in uh, Toronto. I don't know, but those will make a make a. It, it, I think there there's going to be a big change in municipal leadership, which will then challenge Ford uh, in the in the fall. Um, I think Justin Trudeau, as I said earlier in the program, I think he will be probably taking his walk in the snow, which will probably be fall leaves instead of snow. Um, and uh, again, I think the um, the Dems are going to get uh, hit pretty hard in the midterms. Daryl, final word to you. Yeah, I think uh, Liberals, Christian Freeland will be Prime Minister before the end of the year. Conservatives are going to throw a dart and just say uh, Rona Ambrose. Uh, Rona the... Ambrose, really? Okay. Oh. Yeah. He's enjoying uh, her life way too much right now, Daryl. Daryl, you're in your basement. I, I Get out of your basement. On her bench, it would be an improvement. But, but ultimately, uh, in the case of uh, Legault Ford, I agree that they're both going to get reelected, but Ford might be in minority territory depending on what happens with uh, the pandemic. And uh, I think uh, municipal politics, we don't talk a lot about it. I think, unfortunately, what's going to happen is with the U.S. midterm elections and uh, the provincial election, there's going to be a lot of election fatigue by the time that happens. But having said that, I do want to give a, a shout out to the mayors who I think on on balance have uh, done a good job handling given the, the power they have to control this uh, pandemic. And I think generally the way it works in municipal politics is anyone who wants to get reelected, incumbents have a huge uh, advantage. So I don't see any mayors getting uh, defeated outright. I think uh, pretty much all of them who run uh, will get reelected. And in terms of the U.S., uh, Republicans, both houses, and uh, Trump well on the way to win the Republican primary. I think that uh, there's going to be a bunch of news come out about Trump and, uh, and January the 6th and, uh, and also some of his other uh, financial finaglings um, over the course of uh, the next year. And I think that that's going to damage Trump uh, name uh, dramatically. Um, I think that uh, that uh, we're going to see, therefore, Trump and the Republican Party uh, go down in the polls. And it's going to be a lot more competitive than you guys assess. I think Trudeau is going to be um, in uh, leader uh, for at least this year, if not all of 2023. Um, I think the uh, Ford government uh, is going to not do as well as, uh, as some of you think, and I think that there's a good chance for a minority government. Uh, and I think the story is going to be um, the Conservative Party and a fight between the right and, uh, and the centrist and uh, people that want to depose uh, O'Toole and uh, people that want to keep O'Toole in. And I think that's going to be something that we're going to spend a lot of time. And I'd love to hear, Sarah, we don't have time, but at some point in time, I'd like to hear what you would think... Uh, someone that wants to run against O'Toole should be doing, because I think that's going to be an interesting political story, uh, because I do think at some point in time, the liberals will lose. Um, you, you just can't stay in power forever. And so therefore, the conservatives are going to gain government, um, you know, at some point in time in the next couple of years. And the question is, who's going to be the leader and who's going to be the prime minister? And what are the policies going to be? Are they going to be centrist? Or are they going to be right wing? And I think that's going to be an interesting uh, interesting story because you just can't believe that one party is going to stay in, in power yeah, forever. I know we're, we're running uh, low on time, Brian, but do you think a guy like Mark Kearney has any kind of a chance to win in the Liberal Party given how far left they've moved? I think that... Um, that the challenge that Mark Kearney has, I, I was a huge Michael Ignatieff supporter. I thought he was potentially one of the best prime ministers Canada could ever have. And he obviously failed dramatically. And, uh, and I think I worry that Mark Kearney will have the same, uh, uh, the same uh, end result is that uh, for some reason, we don't like intellectuals. Uh, we don't like people that are a lot smarter than us and we don't like being told what to do. Um, and, uh, and I think that Mark Kearney, is maybe too smart for his own good. And, uh, and, and, and I worry that he couldn't therefore be successful in Canadian politics. And I think too, Brian, that, that especially liberals, they wanna have a, a candidate who's got some electoral experience. Yeah, no, I agree. But I do think that, um, you know, whether you go with a right-wing Pierre Polyev uh, or, uh, or a, uh, you know, Daryl, you were saying uh, Ron Ambrose, you know, I think the Conservative Party is going to have a really interesting choice in uh, in the leadership debate, leadership selection um, that's going to come up and uh, and whether they stick with O'Toole or whether the knives come out, I think it's going to be just fascinating from uh, for a political junkie to watch. We thought that last time that the problem right now is that caucus wants to keep O'Toole and the grassroots don't. 
I mean, there's also going to be an issue of apathy, uh, to be honest with you, at this point. I don't know if I'd care enough to vote uh, in the leadership uh, review. And I, I know a lot of people I talk to are sort of in the same boat. They're disappointed with the way things worked out last time. And there isn't exactly huge knives out. It's more people are, have just gone to sleep and uh, are disappointed with what happened. Well, that's the final word. Apathy. Don't care. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mark. Um, let's uh, get together here for now and see, see what, uh, what happened. Well, I think we should get together before a year from now. There's a lot to talk about. Yeah, we got a provincial election. We'll do some commentary during that, but it's always a, a pleasure to be on your show and uh, great guest today. Mark Keeley, Daryl Wolk, Sarah McIntyre, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. That's our show for tonight. Good night, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.